So now that you've got a chance to hear a bit about how barrier synchronization works in general, let's take a deeper dive into one example of a barrier synchronizer, which is called the cat data latch. And what we're going to do here is we're going to describe how the Java cat data latch barrier synchronizer allows one or more threads to wait until a set of operations is being performed and other threads completes. And you can see the countdown latch is a pretty simple interface, so it's not going to take long to explain it. So countdown latch is one of a number of Java barrier synchronizers. We'll talk about a few more. It's best suited for fixed size, one-shot entry and exit barriers. It doesn't implement any, any interface. It's kind of standalone. Internally, it applies a variant of the bridge pattern. And what it basically uses is it uses the abstract queued synchronizer framework, but it, it does it in a slightly different way than things like rent at lock or semaphore and so on. And uh, basically it, it extends, it has this thing called sync, and it, it leverages the ability of the abstract queued synchronizer to wake multiple things up when they need to. The constructor is initialized with a count. As you can see here, you pass a count in to the constructor, and it goes ahead and initializes the sync field with the count. So that's the total number of things that are going to be waiting. Important thing to remember with cat latch, the count can't be reset once you've set it. So all you can do is count it down, but you can't reset it. You have to make a whole new object if you want to, to uh, give it a different number or use it again after it's been counted down. The key methods, there's really just two of them, await and countdown. And these methods, as the name implies, are used to count down, in other words, I'm finished, and wait for the count to equal zero. So underneath the hood, these things just go ahead and forward to the underlying abstract queue synchronizer methods. When you call await, it will block until the count reaches zero. So this is used for various things. Let's talk about the context of how it might be used in the Palantir Manager app. In that case, we're going to have the waiter thread wait for the count to drop to zero. And then it will go ahead and wrap things up and it'll shut down. If you call the timed version of a wait, it will also wait for the count to equal zero, or it'll wait for the time to elapse, or it'll wait for an interrupt. So those are the conditions under which that will return. And that might be if you just don't want to wait around too long. You want to bound the amount of time you're willing to wait. And then countdown simply decrements the count by one. And if the count reaches zero, then all the threads that are waiting, or the thread that's waiting, will go ahead and be released. The key thing to remember here is that calling countdown doesn't cause anything to block. Only await will block. So a wait blocks either indefinitely until an interrupt or if you're using the time version until a timeout occurs. So the nice thing about calling countdown is you don't really know or care who's waiting or how long they're waiting. You just know I'm done, I'm gonna signal them, I'm finished. So that's why it's kind of like a latch. Okay, so that's the end of the first part. I told you this would be pretty fast because it's not a very complicated abstract. So now that we've talked about what a countdown latch is in general, and we'll talk about some of its key Constructor and method behaviors. Let's talk about how you might actually use it to solve a problem. And the problem here is, is actually a fun little example which you can download and, and play with from my website. And what this basically does is it has multiple implementations of the same functionality. In this particular case, I use the greatest common divisor algorithm just because it's simple. And uh, it lends itself to different implementations. And in particular, I have four different implementations. I have an iterative implementation of Euclid's algorithm. I have a recursive implementation of Euclid's algorithm. I have a so-called binary implementation of so-called Stein's algorithm. And then I have one that uses the built-in GCD method that's defined as part of the Java big integer class. And uh, I, won't, I won't run the example for you right now, just for time, if we have time at the end, I'll run it for you. But you can download it and play with it. It's really, it's really cool. And what you discover if you run it, the, these things keep track of how long it's taking to run this stuff. The uh, iterative and recursive Euclid 
algorithms run roughly the same amount of time. The binary version, oddly enough, is a bit slower. Back in the day, the binary version used to be faster, but now compiler optimizers have gotten to the point where using the binary stuff is not faster and it's actually more complicated. And the poor big integer implementation is just unbelievably slow. I, I really don't know why it's so slow, but if you run this thing, you'll see that everybody else is finished and this guy is still just starting up. So whatever they're doing internally in the Java class library implementation of big integer for their greatest common divisor sucks. And uh, this is a nice way to, to see how it sucks. So that's what the thing does. What I really want to do, though, is focus on the part that uses the various kinds of barrier synchronizers. So here is the test program. Here's one of the test programs that exercises those four different implementations. And it also illustrates how to use entry and exit barriers implemented with cat data latches. So what you see here, we go ahead and make barrier synchronizers. Notice they're both cat data latches. We make an entry barrier with a count of one, and you'll see how that gets used. That's, that's used to make sure that the main thread has a chance to get everything up and running before it starts to run the um, GCP computations. And then we're also going to have an exit barrier. And the exit barrier will be used again by the main thread to wait until all the other threads finish running the GCD computations. Once we create the barriers, we then are going to go ahead and iterate through all the tests. And I'll talk more later about how we make these tests. They're, assume for the moment we have a list of tests, one for each different implementation of the GCD function. And we're going to iterate through each of those implementations. We're going to make a new thread, and we're going to give each thread the entry and exit barrier. They need to use those internally. And then we go ahead and start each thread. So let's say we have four different implementations. We have four threads. All those threads get launched. But those threads can't start running yet. And we'll see why in a second. Uh, what will happen here is we're going to do some other work. We're going to print something that says the tests are starting up. And you can imagine us doing other things besides that. But that's the idea that at this point, all these threads are not going to be running. And only when the entry barrier countdown method is called by the main thread will we let the other threads proceed. Now, this is, a tr this is a subtle issue. So what this is doing is this is saying, once the countdown method is called, because remember, it started with a count of one. Now it's down to zero. Anybody who comes along and waits on this entry barrier can proceed. However, this is basically a latch. And that means that all the tester threads, all the ones that are running the GCD computations, don't all start at the same time. They start whenever they get the when they start whenever they get there, and the count is zero. So it might be that one of them starts up, and then a few milliseconds later, another one starts up, and then another one starts up. So whoever gets there first, they can start to run as soon as the countdown has been called. But all the worker threads are not waiting to start at the same time. What they're doing is they're waiting until the main thread says they can start. And that's a subtle difference. And we'll see when we talk about cyclic barrier, how that's a very different behavior with cyclic barriers. Then the main thread control calls a wait. And that will wait for all the other threads to finish running in the background. And the thing to remember here is that we can't reuse this exit barrier. Once a wait returns, we have to make a whole new one because it's, it's a one-shot barrier. It only gets one shot. OK, here now is the GCD countdown latch tester. This is the runnable that's going to be running in a thread. And you can see what it does here is its constructor stores the entry and exit barrier that are passed to it in fields in the object. Remember, that there's going to be one of these per the GCD function per thread. And then this method will wait until the main thread has counted down. Now again, it doesn't wait for the other threads. It just waits for the main thread to count down. So once it's able to run, the test is run, it'll do the GCD computations. And then when it's finished, it uses the countdown method on the exit barrier to say, I'm finished. And when the last one of these things is done, and the count equals 0, then the main thread can proceed. OK, any, any questions about that? The, the actual implementation of this thing is a little bit more cool, but that gives you an overview of it.